Hello everyone, this is Bart Camp. Um, I'm here with Malcolm Blunt and um, we're going to talk about the forthcoming archives release. I've been working on this uh, over three years now and its primary release is during assassination weekend, so the same weekend that we're talking uh, for Lancer. And um, I thought it would be a good thing to talk about this particular archive since there is a lot going on about it. Um, there are a lot of subjects and so forth. I started roughly getting into this. Uh, it was actually a few years before that because I became a member of Dealey Plaza UK in 2014. Malcolm, you've been probably the member since day one, haven't you? Oh, in mid-90s, I think, yeah. Yeah, of course. 95. 95. That's pretty much the beginning of um, Dealey Plaza UK, because uh, it's now 26 years since Ian Griggs started it. Yeah. And um, I heard of Malcolm through through the grapevine about um, at our meetings that we used to have every month, two months in a pub called the Flying Horse in Central London. And, but Malcolm wouldn't come because it was the distance was a little bit too far and um, I kept hearing more and more about him. And then slowly, of course, I also started to look at the videos that Alan Dale uh, did with uh, Malcolm in those years and which have been uh, surmised in, uh, in book form as we speak. <laughs> the Devil is in the Details, uh, it's a book that came out last year, 2020. Uh, it's a very good book about all the conversations that Malcolm and Alan uh, have had. So this is, uh, in, a, in a rough sense, uh, sort of a follow-up on this. So when I heard of Malcolm in 2014, I started watching all these videos uh, on YouTube. And we got in touch 2016, which was during the uh, Canterbury Seminar, which is a three-day seminar in uh, Canterbury on the uh, southeast below London, where all the members get together and um, exchange, of course, ideas, findings, and of course, hold talks. I held a talk that year for about two hours and um, used a lot of documentation and so forth. And Malcolm and I had already been talking earlier that day as well if I could digitize some tapes uh, of Harry Livingston, a handful, it was said, a handful. Um, so um, at the end of the day, when Malcolm left on the Sunday, I interviewed him before that as well. That interview is actually available in parts, in three parts on YouTube. And um, that was the first time I really had a good conversation with him to find out what's what, this, that, and the other. And um, my, I have to say, my my area of interest is slightly different. I mean, I know that Alan talks with Alan, Alan with <clears throat> with Malcolm um, regularly about the Central Intelligence Agency. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, which isn't my area of interest. I read about it, but. It's not my thing to research. So my angle has been different in that sense that I was mostly interested in Malcolm's oldest research from the 90s. So um, And I thought like we need to make a record of that because it differs from what Alan, for instance, has done. So in, on that day, I interviewed him and right after that, he handed a USB stick to Tony Basing and Basing gave that, uh, Tony gave that to me when he came back after dropping uh, Malcolm off at the station. And there was just a, there was two gigs of paperwork in there and um, there was a lot of Nosenko stuff, but there was also a really good document f that was really good for me, which was by the Central Intelligence Agency who basically analyzed all the remarks of where they were, where they saw Oswald, etc., etc. Not much different than what the DPD and the FBI did, but it was just kind of surprising that the Central Intelligence Agency had a four-page diagram put up as such about this whole thing. Um, so that's how it started. I got a few documents on that stick and then slowly Malcolm started sending me some bits. And, uh, you know, there was always an envelope coming with uh, documentation and uh, 
also sometimes a note and say such and such a person uh, has been asking about this can you sort this out so I would do that and just digitize it and the funny thing is is that the digitizing I did with my phone um, because it was the quickest way uh, to do so it beats any other scanner when it comes to speed um, so I started working with that because um, there was talk of doing maybe some bits on um, Harry Livingston because he not only had his t tapes he also had part of his archive so then what happened was that there was a bit of quietness overall because in 17 it was just like send me a handful of documents so I digitized them etc etc it wasn't nothing bulky or voluminous in, in case you're wondering it was just about 20 pages if that then the the real thing started kicking up when I was in the hospital in 2018 and I came out after 10 days and I was like I need to do something and um, contact, got in contact with con, uh, with Malcolm and he took me he says yeah come around because that was the difference everything was sent and now I was like personally make my way down here and um, we he took me to a place that he said, well, this place is full of stuff and um, I'm, I'm going to have to move it soon. And I was like, okay. So there was no real plan. There was no talk of like, do my archive for this and that, blah, blah, blah. There's none of that. What it basically happened was that I, we looked at Harry's Livingston's archive Correct. at first. Yep. And there were like 30 plus 30 five-ish plastic cases about this big and they were filled and Harry had pretty good organization um, he basically had folders by name and um, so I started working with this stuff late November December of 2018 now the in the beginning we we would get together in, uh, here in Malcolm's house and then we would drive to a different location for about 45 minutes and I already had a three hour bus ride and a hours metro ride already behind me so it was about five hours travel and then we got and the first time I got there it was in a town called Tetbury was um, the property that Malcolm had and there was the paperwork was in the back all the cabinet files um, many many drawers of material and uh, of course the plastic cases of uh, Harry so um, it was all like piled in front of each other I remember you had to remove everything of yours just to get access to the Harry Livingston's files because they were all in the corner as so it's all squeezed back so then I basically said okay this is a lot of work um, I will only do the really interesting bits and I'll get all the medical stuff and whatever he had on Dallas because Livingston's archive consisted of well, something that Malcolm doesn't have a heck of a lot of, which is the medical stuff. And then there were certain people that uh, Livingston had, in, had been in touch with, and uh, he had thick files that were very interesting. On top of that, Livingston had not just a handful of cassette tapes. Livingston had two, 250, maybe 300 cassette tapes. I think so. Yeah. And... Um, They've all been digitized. They're all going to be released over the course of next year. Um, there is uh, a lot. He, the thing about Livingston, you can talk about him, you can say about him as bad as you want to be, but he's one of the most diligent researchers and resilient as well because he called everybody. He called everybody. And this is something that a lot of researchers just don't have the cojones to do to, to do so. And he's actually called these people up and... Uh, see if they uh, wish to talk I think a rejection is a little bit of a too much of a factor for people not to talk uh, I think that's true yeah, I think that's true. yeah they're just too scared when they say like I don't want to talk to you blah 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 I've had it with Jimmy Darnell he didn't want to talk mm. you know it happens big deal get over it but um, so I was there for the first three four months I was working on the Livingston stuff and I'd only come in a day and I basically pack a load up and I take it on my trolley with me I had a trolley where I could put three big shopping bags on <clears throat> and 
uh, I would take these back on a bus uh, home. So then at some point I said to Malcolm, this is too much. I've got to be here more, but I don't want to travel back and forth every day, eight hours. So Malcolm says, why don't you stay for a few days? And I said, okay. So we did like these three day trips. And while I was sitting in the front and Malcolm was in the back, because the front was where all the Livingston files were. And uh, we just, we'd stayed in a B and b which was four doors down from your house. And we basically just worked. <clears throat> well, Malcolm did a nine to five, but for me that wasn't enough. So I'd have a bite to eat and then basically go back there for another three or four hours till about, I don't know, 11 o'clock, midnight, you know. And then I thought, well, tomorrow's another day, just do that. And um, um, I, in February, I made the most amazing discoveries of the Dallas files of, of Malcolm's collection. And um, I found uh, certain files that were so valuable and mind-blowing. Then I said, well, I've got to do your stuff. I remember it was in a breakfast the next day and I confessed, I said, I've been naughty. And I said, he says, what have you done? He says, I've, uh, I've started to go through your files and there's all this stuff that I must have. And um, so all of a sudden, just like that, I decided, well, I'm going to do Harry's material, but I'm going to do some of Malcolm's material as well. So, um, at first, Malcolm helped me out and found all the old documents, the dark green folders. Yeah, the old ones. Yeah, the old ones. So, uh, and um, as everybody is probably aware is that Malcolm worked with John Armstrong on Harvey and Lee. And um, there is a lot of, of related material to that in there. Not so much to the two Oswalds, of course there have been sightings as such, this, that and the other. But there was just overall the investigation by the Dallas Police Department, the FBI and so forth. Um, it was uh, very voluminous, but it was also much more detailed that from what I knew um, three years ago, you know, I said like, okay, I knew a fair bit, uh, a good bit, but the real little niggly bits, the, the details, the stuff that looks, that is stuck in the nook and the crannies basically, that is, uh, that was surfacing. And um, like for instance, the Hosey document that I found, um, which is just an absolute bombshell. Uh, for those that don't know, um, the, in the first week of Feb, I think it was the 9th of Feb, I found this document in a pile of uh, Jim Hosey documents. It was about an inch thick, about 200 pages. And I came across a document that was a uh, relatively bad copy, but still very visible, readable, uh, that was taken on Dallas Police affidavit paper on the back of it. And Hosty confirms this in his own book that he made notes on a block of affidavit papers. And in that uh, document, that particular document, he actually recaps the interrogation that he's done. See, Hosty was only present at one um, interrogation of Lee Oswald, which was only the first one, which was the first one which he did, and he made notes. And in that, in that, in that particular sheet, Hosty writes that Oswald went upstairs to get a coke for his lunch, and then went outside to watch the P parade, the presidential parade. Um, that, of course, points to Prayer Man but uh, also confirms something that uh, Hosty did with his FBI report, his joint FBI report of the, um, of the FBI with um, uh, James Bookhout, which they made, which James Bookhout turned 180 degrees around uh, one or two days after Oswald's death. And that was, of course, a whopper uh, of, of a document for my own personal research, but um, there are many other things where you go, white, you know, Every, let's just say, mediocre JFK researcher has read a certain amount of books. So in this archive, in a nutshell, you're basically finding the details of the things that you've read. But on top of that, that little bit of detail that clarifies bits more that certain authors have used, it always has an extra element to it. And you go, all right, I didn't know that. 
and that's what happens a lot with this particular archive. So in Feb, March, April 2019, I absolutely worked my nut off, so to speak, uh, to get it done because the plan was at that point was that to pack everything up that was there in February and to send it to the States. And so I ha and because the property was being sold and it was in its final phase. So the second um, it was exchanged as such, those files had to be uh, put in a container. So while this was all happening regarding the collection that was in Tedbury and was supposed to be shipped, we always went back to Malcolm's house because Malcolm uh, his top room in, uh, in his house. That's where you had file cabinets. And whenever I finished in Tepary, we come back here and uh, we sit upstairs and he goes, oh, I've got this, I've got this, I've got that, I've got this. And every time the same dilemma occurred, reoccurred over and over again, I had too much to carry. So in the beginning, Malcolm gave me his transatlantic suitcase, which was big and heavy. And I filled it up with paper, and uh, I remember two occasions with the uh, bus driver and also the cab driver going like, mate, have you got a corpse in here? Because my... It, and he did weigh a ton. It, it was really heavy. And um, we did that a few times, and then I was like, look, all these trips, and I'd done about maybe seven, eight trips at that point, and all these trips, and I was going, you know what, I need... Uh, I need somebody to drive and so Tony Basing at first helped me out a couple of times and we drove back in heavy traffic and I would take about I don't know nine ten bags with me and then after that Peter Antil has been helping me for the last couple of years and I managed to take more bags at some point I had 27 of them last year yeah, yeah. Um, so I I mean if I have to count how many bags I've probably done almost close to a hundred I think over these three years um, so yeah it's a lot of paperwork um, first of all what I have to say about this archive is that um, it was this disorganized in a, in a how you say this in a rather strange way um, there is a system and I bet it's Malcolm's system but it's not anyone else's system there is just the archive itself ex exposed itself basically gradually about what it had inside so I didn't you know of course you can say well there's Cubans and there's Dallas and there's Washington and this that the other in there, but those are very ambiguous terms so um, You know, you're gonna get there, but you have absolutely no clue what's in these folders and slowly after 18 months a picture started to emerge about actually what was in there and yeah. um, and also by talking with Malcolm that because you know, I've been doing this for more than a year <clears throat> and also, I do know that there's a fair bit of Cuban stuff, but I never knew, for instance, that Malcolm spent three years between the Dallas and the Washington or the, the Central Intelligence Agency stuff that he spent time on the the Cuban matter. And uh, so that was a total new thing to me. There was a lot of material on it as well. So I scanned, basically, I just started blanket scanning everything in at first. And it was only about uh, the summer of last year, 2020, that um, I started to check the RIF numbers. And when I started to check the RIF numbers, I came across a strange phenomenon. That was basically that a lot of the files weren't online. And what I mean online is that when you check the RIF number, then it should basically be part of the list of the files that has been released in 2017 and 2018. But the funny thing is, is that from the main, from all the files, if you look at it over across the board of all the files, whether it's NARA, whether it's the Joint Chiefs of Staff, FBI, Central Intelligence Agency, you name it, 
there are there's a fair percentage of files that aren't that are, have been released in full but still have absolutely no digital footprint whatsoever in, in um, online whether it's at Mary Farrell, whether it's at the archives, whether it's the Black Vault or and a few others there is absolutely no trace of it now at first I thought oh it's 20% of the collection but it's higher it's uh, it's probably double that I, I would say yeah, um, it seems the, like it yeah, yeah it seems the, like it. the fact <clears throat> look this archive isn't organized by riff number because first of all Malcolm went to several archives you know he went to Georgetown he went to Tennessee he went to uh, Baylor Miami, uh, we can name a few more probably, but the bottom line is, is that and those files don't have riffs. So on top of that, when were riffs actually started? Was it in the mid 90s? Yeah, I mean, uh, Joe Backus uh, quite rightly identif identifies that some of the early, sort of the early attempts at uh, finding a early riffs are just complex things, complex series of numbers which don't make any sense, right. uh, even to people that know what they're doing. So it, the, the riff system seems to have started in the early 90s, I think. Right. And um, the sheets look different it, as well. It's 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 uh, you know it's it's a pretty good system. You can usually track things through riffs. Right. Yeah. You can usually accept, obviously, as you're finding, you're not. Uh, yeah. They're not online, a lot yeah. of stuff. And, and, it just is not online. And is this suspicious? No, um, because the real interesting files have disappeared anyway, So and they are listed as such in documents where it says such and such has been destroyed and so forth, blah, blah, blah. But when I look at the so-called thing where I basically write on the riff sheet, not online, it could be a newspaper article or it could be a very heavy duty document it doesn't matter it there's i can't say it's nefarious because it's also across the board every agency every commission every person whatsoever has got a riff sheet with missing with files that aren't online so while people debate about the so-called missing files from say david morales or other people etc etc that's all fine and dandy. The problem is much bigger. Um, from what I've been talking to, to with Joe Bax, it's roughly only half of the material has been released officially and for everyone to look at. So that's a total different picture than uh, David Morales' files, which will probably say absolutely nothing about Kennedy. So, uh, well, David Morales' files were released pretty well intact, his personnel. Yeah, yeah, I've got that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, there, there are always you know files which relate to uh, David Morales. As, as you've just alluded to, there's so much missing material. Anyway, without without what you're finding, you know, it's just in just huge, and uh, all the stuff that we need, we needed to look at to to bring a resolution to. Uh, uh, bring an understanding to the case. It's 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 gone. Yeah. You know, wherever you go, through the through all the files, wherever you go, uh, the essential stuff. You, you, it's just it's been taken, disappeared. No one can explain it. it just just goes. I mean, uh, the U.S. I always bang on about the the, the U.S. Customs stuff. U.S. Customs and INS officials that tried to tell a story, tried to tell the truth, and then um, to the Church Committee, and then all that stuff has disappeared. Yeah, you only find it in the footnotes of um, FBI files. Of, of, no, footnotes of the draft oh. of the Church Committee. Right, the draft material, and you find the in the footnotes it refers to. Um, testimony or deposition of INS inspector or customs official you know so but none of that stuff is available we do have we do have in Robert the Attorney General Robert Creech's files the a, a sort of one page debriefs that um, the customs and INS people in New Orleans 
did. In other words, they testified and then they came back either to INS or to um, uh, Customs uh, and with, with the DOJ sat in and um, basically whatever they said we have indications of what they, or indeed what they did say, that they had, uh, they had connections with Oswald, both INS and Customs. They, they completely uh, turned 180 degrees, you know, uh, the, the debriefs, the, the scant debriefs are just very bland, they don't really say anything. Uh, when you've got uh, an INS in, uh, inspector called Wendell Roach in his first contact with the church committee saying uh, I've been waiting 12 years to, to talk about this because he thought he was under the uh, impression that the Warren Commission would have contacted him but they didn't of course there was no way they were going to get INS people and customs people because they would confirm um, an interest in Oswald so there you go yeah, so th this is also uh, part... That's a big missing lump. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I mean, you do this quite a bit, actually, when you look at the paperwork, for looking for files that have been marked for destruction or have been destroyed and so forth. Um, some of the letters that I read was like, well, it's company policy. We do this after X amount of years and we just get rid sure. of it. Um, that's what they hide behind, like companies hide behind they do, COVID they, now. To be fair, but they do, like the, the Central Intelligence Agency, does have uh, rules and regulations which it, the bureaucracy follows. Uh, one of the most interesting ones um, I came across when I went through the, the various handbooks, uh, headquarters regulations, was the fact that uh, their personnel records their personnel records, uh, let me think when this was, yeah, the personnel records were kept, were, uh, there, there was a, a, a time limit that they kept personnel records for, and that was 56 years. Don't ask me why 56 years. 56 years, then they're destroyed. Well, the sad thing about that is when you count forward from the assassination of 56 years, where, where did it, yeah. so we've lost they're going to say in the future, oh well, you know, we destroyed so and so's files, Two we destroyed X's files, we destroyed Y's files, because it was within, our, within the regulations. 56 years, they're destroyed. Unless somebody, of course, said, no, they fall under such and such, they can't be destroyed, it's such blah blah blah. Mm, but well, I, nobody's I, bothered I, about I, that, are they? I mean, it, uh, most people don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's my new shot. <laughs> <laughs> So now you, you just did a, a brilliant example of uh, the the customs uh, and uh, the collection, the collection of that. But there, there's some other good examples. Um, there's of course um, the Warren Commission, sure. um, its files um, that were sent in cabinets to was it sixty seven to the archives for them to basically. The witness, it was the witness testimonies, wasn't that it? Went in, that, that came up to, uh, that was sent from the US Attorney's Office in Dallas. Right. And it was labelled, uh, well, there were two There were two parts to that. There were, the first part was what the US Attorney's in Dallas called no good testimony, which was the stuff that they'd excised from witnesses' statements. Yeah. They didn't destroy it, they sent it to the National Archives. So there you go. But it, unfortunately, it didn't survive at the National Archives. Just a few, just a few pages, just a few folders. Nothing much survived. And then they sent up what they called, um, obviously, the unedited depositions. In other words, before they were edited, the unedited. Uh, the, the real gold. Yeah, the, the stuff that you you need. That to I want. Yeah. That came up in four boxes. In. Uh, April of 65, 1965, with an accession number, uh, you know, it's stamped on the document, and the accession number is supposed to take you, even today, even if it's an obsolete accession number, it's supposed to take you to the documents. 
you know, I try to I try to get uh, to make progress on that, and uh, didn't get anywhere at all. The accession number for the layman is Sorry? a gold ticket, basically, <laughs> for you to go to Nara, present that number, and they will know where to go instead of going through a very circumvented system, which normally runs where you basically have to. You have to give them the information, they then go look in their database where it actually is, and then they bring it back. It's quite convoluted, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, I, never got, I never had enough time to do it, but if you go to the National Archives' um, own administrative files, which is 16 boxes, then you're going to find a lot of um, accession numbers in there. So. That was something I never got to do, but I mean, if you could knock out a list of the accession numbers, that would be a, that would be a great finding aid. It's, it's separate, something uh, something we haven't got now, so that would be like an alternative finding aid. But, uh, uh, I think we we depend really on uh, on the national archives to to play fair, really. And some parts of it do, and some parts of it, I'm not so sure. Mm. Yeah, yeah, a bit of a strange one. So when I basically started to finish at Tedbury and then went upstairs, I basically spent 18 months collecting material from Malcolm's personal collection after the warehouse. So and then. Covid happened, and um, we were not able. I wasn't able to do something for about three months. Late June last year, I went back at it, and then uh, that's when I got that massive load of twenty-seven bags last year in June. And then um, all of a sudden, in the uh, we started talking about what's with what's with the stuff from Tedbury, this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. And at that point, when we started talking about it, it was a year after I finished and uh, that collection as much as I could and um, I found out that the collection was still at the warehouse and so forth. I thought at first that it was in a container in a field just in the <laughs> middle of nowhere that was yeah. what I pictured but it wasn't uh, it was just uh, in a huge warehouse building where uh, Malcolm had a like a back corner area where everything was uh, stored and it was uh, December 2020 when we, I managed, uh, Peter and I managed to get back into that and started scanning this material. So now it's uh, end of September and I'm pretty much finished with that part. So that took another eight, nine months to work on uh, from what was left. And then I roughly calculated how many bags were in there. And I think you've got about roughly the same collection. Uh, I think you, you, your collection was pretty much split in half, right? the Tedbury bit and the bit that you had here. Mm -hmm. So it kept me busy, basically. And then uh, we're now slowly going back to the materials that uh, are closest to Malcolm, like his working files as such, um, which are the, the files are just different in character. Um, of course, you won't see much of that when when you are going to that collection, but um, f the old stuff was obviously the Dallas police, FBI related with Dallas and New Orleans. There's so much stuff on New Orleans as well. If you are into Garrison and uh, Ferry and Shaw and uh, uh, God, uh, the uh, Civil Air Patrol and uh, Fair Play for Cuba, and you just you just go on and on and on. There's just an absolute ton of stuff to read about uh, that chapter. And uh, these, um, um, as you all, some of you already know, is that I've been releasing some separate videos because this is just a generic one about this archive. Whereas um, Malcolm and I also talk about a particular subject. Um, we did one on Yuri Nosenko recently. We're going to do one on Fred Reeves of the ONI. So we will delve into certain uh, sectors and sections and persons of, uh, of that archive to give uh, 
a little bit more of an explanation and uh, a better understanding can be created um, if you are looking. Um, there's going to be also a video about how to use the archive which is relatively simple to do. Um, the reason why I didn't do a riff based numbered archive just to go back to that bit I spoke about 10 minutes ago is not every document is uh, from the NARA but also sometimes you didn't grab you didn't grab the brief sheet? No. Why was that? Why did you say forget about it? I just think, uh, you know, when... I think it crossed my mind that, you know, I was only going to get one shot at this. And when you're talking of the sheer volume of stuff, when you're talking about the House Select Committee on Assassinations, number of boxes of their numbered files, uh, that's 302 boxes. I mean just on its own, and then when you go into the field office files, uh, you've got 48 field, op field office, uh, field op FBI field offices in America, and each one had uh, a JFK investigation file, an Oswald file, a Ruby file, you know, all these different personalities files. You're talking thousands, really, of boxes. You, you, you just can't do it, you just can't, you, you just have to take a snapshot. Now, I mean, there was a lot of stuff as I went through, particularly the HSCA files, when I thought, well, that's interesting, but not to me, but it could be to, for somebody in the future. So you just grab what you can, you just grab what you can. I realise that's a very non-academic way of doing things, but at least there's something there, at least there's something. If you can grab something, it's better than nothing. It sounds almost like my way because I started to learn about the collection bit by bit over time and how how it functions and what's in there and I slowly started to understand as well. It's like, well, if you have a document that's, say, 200 pages thick and it's only got 20 pages of... Right. Well, that's a perfect instance. Yeah. There were... There were Certainly, quite a few uh, depositions and testimonies with the uh, HSCA took. I, I, I probably grabbed maybe 10 pages, yeah. 20 pages, Angleton. instead of hundreds of yeah. pages. Yeah. So, just to give a snapshot and a, and a feel of um, the interview, then people could maybe go back and request it via NARA. You know, uh, you'd have the name, for instance, of uh, Tony Verona. I think I copied about 10 pages of Tony Verona's. Um, deposition. I think that was that ran hundreds of pages, so you could go back and you could request of it, request of Nara uh, Tony Verona's HSCA statement. If you're interested, if if you're interested in following that up, I mean, but you to copy hundreds of pages, yeah, it's just it's just not just not right. Yeah. I mean, there are people that do it the right way. And Joe Bacchus, God bless him, is one of these guys. He does it very painstakingly, Ridiculous. accurately, yeah. and, he, and he quite rightly wants things done in a proper fashion. But when you're looking at the sheer volume of material, it's, it's unending at the National Archives. And there's so many things, as I reflect, I would love to get back to the, the National Archives administrative files. I would love to get back to those because, um, thanks to you, in a certain ex to a certain extent, I, you know, there's going to be in the first two boxes or three boxes of uh, those admin files are all the early Warren Commission handwritten notes. So that I would like to get back to. I mean, I would like to get back to the ranking papers because I'm sure you and me they both. were heavily excised, screened by CIA. I, I'm almost sure. So I would love to get back to those. There's lots of files, NARA's own files, that I would like to get into again. So, because each archivist had their own files as well. You know, uh, Marion Johnson had his own files and Bomer had his own files. All these people have their files. So, 
was it that it, a lot of the Admo parts <coughs> are interesting because of uh, the number of researchers that wrote in about their interests, requesting it, requesting this or requesting that, and, and that was all that was all captured by NARA and put into files. So if you if you're really interested in the early stuff, then that's that's uh, really that's a gift. Hmm. To get into those files, because I mean, it's, there's just so many. I mean, the HSCA, uh, FBI files, they're a fascinating group because they got a lot of stuff that um, the Warren Commission certainly didn't get. And HSCA had uh, a more complete version, I think, of uh, the, JF, the FBI, JFK. JFK investigation files than the FBI sent to the National Archives. So there's, uh, you, I think you need 500 years <laughs> to do this. One day, somebody will have the brain to actually and create an idea where basically they have a really good scanner and start scanning this stuff in, in bulk and super fast. And uh, maybe we'll get lucky because, you know, but look at it like with the pages that they've released in 2017 and 2018, which of course, to me, 90% of it is rubbish. Um, <clears throat> what do I want to know about FBI informants in whatever American city is such? It's not really of importance. Um, I can understand why they wanted that stuff uh, kept under the, under the carpet uh, because of all these names coming out. Well, probably the, one of the most important things when we talk about the early stuff, the Warren Commission, and I never knew it until I got into the admin files, the Warren Commission administrative files, was the fact that um, the chief archivist, Marion Johnson, maintained a desk which he sat at. He, he's supposed to be dealing with lots of stuff. Yeah. But his desk was in the area, right, sat in the middle of the Warren Commission files. I mean, that's micromanaging. It's making sure that all the requests that are coming in... Go through him. He's, he's doing them. He's, yeah. he's, he's, he's making sure that stuff... He's micromanaging the stuff. And anyway, you see in those files the amount of uh, discussion about Harold Weisberg. They're really concerned about how I know. <laughs> yeah, really. I've, I've read a few FBI documents They're as well. Happy with him. And they, they, they don't like him at all no. because he knows exactly where to look and say, "Yeah, it's over there and there. Go give me that. Go get me that." Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's. But you do get good guys, you know. Harold's files are. Uh, I'm trying to think what they're. They're in Record Group uh, One Twenty Two, I think. And um, hit all Harold's FOIA files are there. And if you go into the National Archives, number one, request a, request a, that cart full of files, those 22 boxes, and read them because they are really essential in understanding the case. No, I read. Um, his disdain. It's also, it's like, you know what, you just bullshitted me around, la di da di da I found this such and such, I know it's over there, why are you not blah blah blah, cooperating and so on. But he, he got zero uh, cooperation, well, very poor cooperation from the National Archives, they were always trying to, you know, diss him, they were always trying to pop him off. And, um, but with the Department of Justice, the FOIA section, there was a guy in there that worked with Harold. A guy called Quinn Shea, and that guy is a hero because he, he didn't fault Harold off. He tried to do what Harold asked him to do, and they got on well. They got on well. But um, so there are people in the bureaucracy that, that not everybody's the same. And, and Harold found Quinn Shea at the Department of Justice a good guy. It's interesting that of course. Harold never knew. Uh, um, I remember visiting him in 90, 1998, I think it was, when he was in a nursing home with um, his wife. And um, we 
we were talking and uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, his files his files were in the National Archives and he was absolutely astounded nobody nobody told him nobody mentioned it to him he had no knowledge of that and uh, I, he, as I remember I think he asked me to repeat the fact that uh, they were there I said they are there they're in 22 boxes on one cart I said I've been looking at them and uh, I mean I don't I don't think you would say that Harold was in any way an emotional person but he was emotional then because he knew that his work was available for researchers and it is so yeah. well you copied a fair bit of it I did yeah uh, <coughs> I've read uh, again it's only a snapshot I know but <laughs> I, I, I know with everything but um, uh, what 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 you do have is extremely interesting. Actually, as a side note, is that in 2015, when I started to delve through Weisberg's archive at Hood College, and it was the first properly organized archive um, online as such, and everything was in PDF, the search engine is just does what it needs to do so it just does it what it says on the tin you put your names in and it comes up with all the documents and so forth so everything is like uh, as object character well, recognition that's, that's another unsung hero I mean Clayton Ogilvy yeah. did all that work yeah. and uh, you know I've been at National Archives with uh, Clayton when he's been doing this stuff going through FBI files and you know, just getting it scanned in and all the rest of it and it's he just sits there plodding away, yeah. plodding away, plodding away. It's day a in, day job. Out. It's a lot of work. What he did was was massive. It's a lot of work. Absolutely massive. Unsung hero, yeah. So what we have now in the archive, when we're talking about size, <clears throat> I think roughly I've done about one hundred and fifty thousand pages, and probably about. Anything between 12,000 and 14,000 PDF files. Anything from one page to, well, I think the biggest one I have is 400 pages, but that's a, that's a rarity. Bill, uh, Bill Alexander's file on Jack Ruby. Fantastic. <laughs> Not online either. 400 pages from the file from Bill Alexander on every associate of Jack Ruby and so forth. Um, it was in one of your... Arch lever boxes. It filled oh, yeah, the whole, yeah, it yeah, filled yeah. the whole box up, and I thought, oh, this will be online. And then I looked, and I went, there's no way to be seen. I was like, no way. And I was like, Bill Alexander, Jack Ruby, 400 pages. And I was like, there's plenty to read on that. Um, so there's a lot available for this primary release. I've got about a year left to do so. Uh, there will be weekly bi-monthly updates um, you can easily see that by the date of uh, uploading as such i've also worked on a folder system which is no different than say a my documents folder on a, on a windows pc and um, so i've got a cia folder obviously and in that cia folder i've got a lot of subfolders and this goes basically for every agency um, you also start to learn well I did at least is how certain things actually work so for instance G Robert Blakey give you a really simple example G Robert Blakey of course the head on show of the HSCA he wrote tons of times to Scott Breckenridge of the Central Intelligence Agency so you see this whole correspondence of them basically him trying to get the documents him Breckenridge should be difficult or yeah. saying he can't this and he can't do that and blah 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 that by itself is a story on its own just that little bit you can just do a talk on it for half an hour by just bringing the documents in as such and this is how basically the whole archive works um, you can search riff numbers through that archive it's just that they won't show, but of course the OCR inside that archive takes these numbers 
in his brain. And of course, if you if you know the riff number of a particular document that you can't find online, then it might be in Malcolm's archive. So just punch in the number and it will take you there, hopefully. Um, the, the archive will be released in what I call Assassination Weekend. There will be one generic link for it. I will share this with you guys on the day of uh, that this video is coming out. And uh, that will allow you to go through everything that I've done of Malcolm. And from the various archives, uh, there are little snippets in there as well. And that ought to keep people busy. Um, the way I look at it is that if you've been interested in books, say for instance you've read, uh, let's call something, Destiny Betrayed. Okay, let's go to New Orleans. So then you get to read a good summarization of what happens in, in, in New Orleans, but there's much more to it. And that's when the documents come in. And the beauty of that, what I find, is that if you read certain bits in a book that interest you, and then all of a sudden you get a document that adds on to that bit and they go, oh yeah, remember that, this, that, and the other. And, the, and then that comes on top of what, uh, what you've been reading before. And it's also possible that a researcher basically in his book writes about a certain passage in the document and you find that document, you could find something else in that document where you go, but he didn't write about that because that particular sentence was relating to a subject the writer was talking about so and then all of a sudden you get that document and then there's some other nugget of gold that might just be uh, in there and, and and helps you with your research as such um, I think we're going to have another talk about this in the future when uh, we're getting more near completion and the entire document has been done and dusted and sorted I'm not sure whether you made available whether you're still working yourself on bits of what I call unfinished business. Well, there are documents in folders that I found where you say, ever said research or sort, yeah. yeah, and then you find a folder with 20 different subjects in it. I was thinking specifically about the um, record out film, a Dallas Space film, ah. and the, all the same, chicanery. Say no more. That. I've kept every sheet apart. I've kept it behind because you know how big it is? The paperwork. <laughs> that big. <laughs> uh, now more probably. Maybe more. Yeah. I've kept, and I'll confess it here to you and to the rest of the world, <laughs> I've kept four bags of papers behind. All right. <laughs> so, and that is basically one bag is, I think, just the Dallas police evidence. Yeah, that's what that's you know. The that photography always bugged me because I never finished it. Uh, you know, we will. You're always moving on to something else. Yeah. You're moving on to something else. So Malcolm wrote an article about this in 1999, and there, while going through the archives, there are about five or six different drafts of this. Uh, it's about a six-page document, and uh, when it comes to the Dallas police evidence, I'll just say it in a nutshell because we will get back to this at some point. Is that there were six scenarios. If you follow the paperwork, you could only put six scenarios together, mm -hmm. different scenarios, because the biggest problem of all are the dates on the documents, because they the synchronicity is absolutely shot to smithereens uh, from especially from the FBI as such. Yeah, we're recording. <sighs> Gonna be fun editing this. No, we're just uh, returning from a power cut. The battery went dead. Um, <laughs> the the archive, as said, will be available end of November. You will have access to almost all of it um, gradually over the years more documents but also uh, more audio will be released I think I've done about something between 250 and 300 audio recordings um, I'd say two-thirds would be Harry Livingston related um, mostly the doctors and so forth which will 
also be released uh, in stages next year. And then of course I've already released a lot of videos because you gave me an absolutely sack full, boxes full of video, VHS videotapes. Um, of which the majority has been digitized and also uh, made available on the me, uh, the Lone Gunman um, YouTube channel. And there's a couple of rare bits in there like uh, Jerry Patrick Hemming in black and white in the 60s filmed outside some airfield uh, for television and um, isn't this around the time that he that JFK came to Florida, or is it before? I don't know. I'm trying to think when that was. Uh, that was in sixty. I think that was in sixty two. Oh right, the year before the Hemming thing. Yeah. Right, yeah. and then uh, when they were after they were arrested, his uh, his group were arrested at one stage, and then you know, like a lot of these. Soldier of Fortune things that were going on then, they they don't do a day in jail really. It's just like, it's just a joke. True, very true. And the other one which is really cool is uh, Gus Rose at this dinner in Dallas and uh, giving a nice little dinner speech of about almost an hour. That's a rarity. Yeah, well, the way you told me was it was rarer than hobby horse manure so uh, mm. I was like right and uh, it is it is very rare for someone to see to speak freely uh, uh, he's free he, he, he's free and amongst friends and um, so you get a different a Just different perspective different perspective especially on the Minox camera and um, yeah, yeah. odds and sorts but uh, you know that's two out of many videos uh, that uh, overall are really interesting uh, to go through um, some of the uh, you obviously when you started attending all these uh, conferences they, they basically got the videos so there's some really old stuff uh, from uh, 93, 94, 95, ask conferences. I lost a lot. I, lo I loaned some to a, um, a member of our group who mm. shall be nameless and I never got them back. He'll get a call. <laughs> <laughs> From me! <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, I hope you all enjoy this a bit. Um, you know, if you have a question, feel free to ask. You know where to find me. Um, and if I can, if you're looking for something specific, then uh, you know, say me, a, tell me a name, and I'll, I'll I'll forward whatever I've got, but you don't have or can't get hold of. And um, uh, yeah, that's that. This is end of part one, and uh, probably uh, we'll do another talk for next year if you want me after all this, and um, then uh, we'll, at which point probably the archive ought to be finished or is very close to be finished as such. Thank you very much. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings at home. See you later. Bye-bye.